Hello everyone, welcome to this new episode of Learning from the Masters and today we're gonna talk about Mexican artist uh, Frida Kahlo. I think, well, this is the first, it's the first woman that we have in this show. So, first woman. Uh, I didn't want to put the vote, I, I thought it was, uh, it's been, it's been too long and uh, well in the entire history of art because uh, you know how history is not many women uh, modern history is more but like in the entire history not many women so I picked Frida uh, because I, I um, I'm really interested in the in the, in the approach and in the way of seeing uh, the representation of the self the body Lots of things, very interesting and cool things to, to talk about with uh, with Kahlo. So um, yeah, just a great artist and it's going to be fun. And apparently it's already starting a debate. People say don't like Frida, people say love Frida. Um, and uh, well, well, there's no way to like please everyone. And uh, I don't think it was Frida Kahlo's uh, concern in any sort of way. So we're just going to see what she can offer us in terms of representing the, the psyche and understanding um, pain and, and suffering, which are um, like pain and suffering are two, two concepts that are concepts that are philosophically different. So maybe we have a, we'll have a, a um, we'll have a better understanding on, on how this, um, um, what, what's the difference between the two? Maybe we'll have, we'll, it will help us understand a lot of things. So, um, yeah, a great artist. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the of the style of the the, the the painting itself, but the themes, the the pictures, the ideas, and how everything is mixed with a vision of the self is uh, very very interesting to me at least. So I think it's interesting, and I I hope I'm I'm going to make it interesting for you, even if you don't like Frida. Uh, so hello everyone. Hello Hernando, hello Marian Burak, hello Casper Kor, hello RD2, <laughs> RD2 from Switzerland, hello Polar Bear, and um, yeah, uh, you Polar Bear worked, participated in helping out ThamesCon, what, what's ThamesCon? And uh, Can Prince says, love Frida. So it's like, it's kind of mixed feelings about Frida, right? Um, well, uh, anyway, if you don't, if you don't know uh, Kahlo, well, there's, uh, there are several documentaries. I, I even think there's a movie, um, like a, um, a, a biographical movie about her life. Um, many of the movies that I've seen were really interested. Uh, it's a kind of a, a of an unusual story, uh, very very unusual, and um, yeah, an exceptional life really. And um, and uh, it, it's interesting, even if you don't like the style per se. It's uh, even like. Let's say you like uh, Vermeer a lot more, like stylistically speaking, the, the the life and experience that Frida Kahlo's had in her life was like a lot more, like there's a lot to talk about. Like you have the story and the paintings and you can put the two together. So it's very interesting as a, as a movie. Uh, I don't really know about Vermeer's life, but I, I'm just picking examples like this. But um, well, anyway, like she had a very interesting, sorry, a very interesting uh, life. So um, if you're interested, you can you can probably find a, a documentary online or or the movie. I, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly. I, I know that I've seen some things. I don't remember exactly. 
um, but everything that I've seen about uh, about her was very interesting. So, yeah. Um, hello, Jim, and hello, Duhamel Master. Uh, hello, uh, who else? Court. 1991. So, for those of you who don't know, movie is Frida. Yeah, simply Frida. Yeah, th that's the movie like the. Not not documentary movie. It's just the mo Well, it's it is a biography. Um, a bio bio movie bio topic. Like I don't know. Um, oh yeah, with Salma Hayek. Yeah, oh yeah, I remember that. I don't know if, if that's the one I've seen. I, I, it's been a while. I, I think I've seen the movie and the documentary. Uh, one documentary. Like, one, like, you know, among many. But very interesting. And, um, yeah, well, if you don't know, well, let's say... Uh, Frida um, had a, well, this is FridaCalo.org. I don't know how reliable this source is. I didn't check it, but doesn't seem to tell too many, um, too many, doesn't seem to have too many mistakes to my eyes. So I'm not an expert as always. I'm not a historian or anything uh, but so this is the important part that you you'll see in in the paintings and this will appear very very uh, strongly in the paintings that she suffered um, so she nearly died in a bus accident and she suffered multiple fractures of her spine collarbones and ribs a shattered pelvis, broken foot, and dislocated shoulder. She began to focus heavily on painting while recovering in her in a body cast. And in her lifetime, which I didn't remember, she had 30 operations. So basically, um, this this original pain. And, and suffering was central in in her work in most of what she did actually uh, after this time and she began to really reflect and uh, one thing that you have to know is that well she is considered a surrealist well she can be considered a surrealist under some some aspects I don't know well if, if any of you really know Frida and um, can tell your opinion what do you think she is in terms of movement uh, because to me yeah to me she belong she belongs in a very very special way though but um, she belongs to surrealism Hmm. Uh, there's a movie on Netflix. All right, good to know. Hello, Jasim. R2D2, like last Wednesday. <laughs> All right, sorry, R2D2, but if you want to be called R2D2, why isn't it spelled R2D2? <laughs> Why make things simple in a YouTube username? Why? All right, so let's let's just see. So, like technically speaking, in terms of of color brush brush handling, it's nothing really really interesting. It's not like it's not like zooming at a sergeant it's more about the themes 
it's more about、uh, picturing. So remember that、uh, Callow had a injuries on her spine.、Uh, she had many injuries. She was experiencing a lot of pain, and her health was、um, was really.、Um, Going re, where there was re ups and downs, so、uh, everything she focused on after the bus accident was really about about this about this representation of the the body and this representation of of pain and suffering. So clearly, that's very very strong、um, to just. In 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 place of the the spine, you have I don't know, kind of a metal bar. I think she just tried to express like the to express visually the kind of pain that she was feeling. I don't know. I don't know what could have happened、um, if the injury, if the bus accident never happened.、Um, sorry to say, really. Would have she became? Would have she become a an artist at all, or or、uh, or not? Or how would have? How would the the paintings、um, feel? If this accident never happened, right? So yeah, kind of a an unusual. So she was really well known for the famous self self portraits, you know, with the、um, the kind of、um, the famous unibrow. Uh, but yeah, in terms of brush handling, yeah, not not nothing really to say. It's not doesn't look very good. I don't know what what's going on with all these、uh, tiny holes right there. All right, she's my personal art goddess. Wow, that's cool, Cat's Gallery, because、um, people have mixed feelings. So it's either you love or or you you hate or you don't like. I mean, at least. Uh, not my style at all. Her past is inspirational, though. Well. That's、uh, well. If it's not your style, I understand. But like in terms of pure painting style, like the, the the brush handling and how it looks on the canvas,、um, yeah, it's、um, there's nothing really special in terms of、um, of style. But well, if you if you take another, well, I'm going to consider. I'm going to start considering. Callow as a surrealist artist.、Uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I'm gonna call her surrealist, right?、Um, compared to, let's say, Dali, for instance, another famous surrealist, I think Frida has a much more interesting approach to the psyche, to、um, and and a much more Like genuine, genuine、um, approach to the world, the inner world of the of of the mind, the the psyche, the psychology, and a much more. To me, I, I feel much more interested in Callo than Dali, for instance. I know I'm、um, uh, maybe this is blasphemy for you guys because I know that. 
Dali has lots of fans, but to me Dali is a lot of fake, fake dreams, like just just random pictures put together, and 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 you throw that uh, like like this, and and the painting style as well, like Dali for instance, is is appreciated by many because he still had a figurative style at a point where figuration uh, was kind of uh, kind of outdated and everyone was doing abstract, everyone was doing something else conceptual and Dali was still painting figurative so he became uh, very uh, very appreciated and liked for that but if you really look at Dali's brush handling it, it's it's not it's, it's not nothing to nothing to dream about um, nothing like yeah, like the brush handling is not not perfect. So, what what really matters with these surrealists is the themes and how they bring the ideas onto the canvas. And in my opinion, I, I feel much more connected to an artist like uh, Callot than an artist like Dali. Uh, much more. Um, because I, I think that there is some some type of honesty that you, you you find in Frida that you don't find in in Dali. But well, that's just my debate. Uh, well, in considering that the two are comparable, which they aren't, I know. But I I feel much more connected to something like this, for instance. Even if the like the painting style has nothing special to offer, but like I mean the 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 picture is very very strong and and you cannot not feel what she's feeling right now, what she's expressing. And uh, yeah, you know Dali had much better composition and like the landscape would be much smoother with very very licked uh, clouds and all. But I feel the pain. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's uh, almost impossible to withstand for me. And I, I really understand. Well, no, I can't say I really understand. I, I think I will never understand. But that's the closest to understanding uh, the pain she was experiencing that anyone can get. And uh, you know, when when you're, um, I. I I wish that to no one, but like you know, when you're in a hospital and the nurse, the nurse, sorry, uh, or the doctor comes to check on on your pain level, and they'll ask. I, I don't know if it's the same in every country, and and if you don't know that, um, if you don't know that, that's uh, good for you, and I wish that it stays this way. But every time you you're in pain and you're suffering, they ask you to like to rate your pain level on a scale from 1 to 10 10 being the highest or like a various like different type of scale and and because they they are trying to understand exactly uh, how much pain you experience because that that's important for them if they are going to give you some some medication if they're going to give you something to treat and to and to ease the pain, uh, they have to understand how bad you feel. So they ask you to rate, to give a grade from one to ten, to to know exactly, um, to to know better what type of pain and and how hard it is. But with a painting like this, it's it's immediate. Um, it's an immediate transmission of, of the pain, the, the terrible, terrible pain. And, um, and you cannot miss it. I mean, it's, um, it's hard to not get it, right? And that makes a strong painting, in my opinion, which is why I feel connected, because I feel that this is strong, this is super strong, and... Um, and uh, yeah, 
you forget about the rest, you forget about the brush handling, it doesn't matter really, because there is something more important. There is something more important than you, there is something more important than, than the canvas itself. There is the suffering and the pain of, of a woman. And uh, yeah, and uh, I feel strongly the connection. All right. Eyebrows are scary. Yeah, but they're kind of a trademark. Uh, why does she draw the eyebrows? I, because I think that she had the eyebrows like this. Um, not all too bothered about her. Okay, send me a message. Um, <laughs> Again, the eyebrows. Yes, it's always the eyebrows because I think that this is sh how she had them. Let me try to find a... Uh, let me try to find a picture. Uh, it's not the perfect picture right here. Um, so that's basically how she had them. Trying to find a, a real picture. Sorry, I'm trying to find the right, the right picture right here. See, I think she really had the eyebrows. <laughs> That's just about the, the personality. I, I don't think she um, tried to remove or shape them in any sort of way. Just kept it, kept the eyebrows as they were. So this was done in 44 and the broken column, the broken spine is, um, is quite liberal for, for her. And um, yeah, the man here is uh, Diego Rivera, Re Rivera, yeah, uh, not Riviera, Rivera, a Mexican artist. Um, was uh, famous at the same time. I think during his life he was more famous than Kahlo. Uh But like nowadays, less. I think he was. He is less famous. Uh, he was famous for painting the a fresque fresco for. The, the Ford building or I don't know what kind of building um, so yeah Let's go. <laughs> Let's go more into. It's quite gruesome, actually. But like understanding the backstory. If you just see that, you say, oh, like, it's, it's just, uh, just repulsing. Uh, but like knowing the backstory.
but it's still kind of gruesome, very, very gruesome. And uh, self-portrait with small monkeys, 1945. So why the monkeys? I I don't know. If anyone has a uh, an interpretation about the monkeys. Mm. Uh, it's interesting she put columns for the spine. Uh, change my name. Oh, R2D2. Oh, you can change your name. So welcome R2D2. It's going to be uh, easier for me to, to read. Uh, I always read quite fast. Uh, I agree with Yassim. Um, hello, Barbara Loveless. I think if Frida were alive today, she would not get the fame she got in the 19th century. Yeah, which is um, true for uh, a lot of artists, uh, Jasim. A lot of artists um, would uh, probably be the same. Like, let's take, uh, let's take Duchamp, for instance, with the urinal. Like, you know, Armut the urinal. Um, like do that today and you're just a common, very common artist. Uh, be the first to do it and you mark history. That's the thing. And, uh, and yeah, you open a door and if you were the first one to do it, it's quite remarkable. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a case for, for many She said something like, maybe there is someone out there just like me concerning her unibrow. Um, she didn't alter it because she didn't feel her self-portraits would be genuine if she changed. And I think that uh, it's also a mark that kind of um, makes her unique and she, she kind of liked it. I think she went over the over the top with what differentiates her appearance i think her unibrow is not as strong in real life and i, I doubt it was as strong and even like the the light <laughs> the light uh, facial hair was not as strong as well it was barely noticeable but I think she was so concerned with her own body, her own appearance, that um, to her, she, it was um, a lot more. Like if you look at this, the, the picture right here, for instance, uh, or this one, uh, it's not comparable. The unibrow is not as strong at all. So... I think she forced the, these features because um, she wanted to make it more more personal, and and she, she she was very focused on on these little details. So um, uh, what's the app website you're opening the paintings? It's the Google Arts and Culture project. Uh, uh, so Barbara is saying that um, Diego Rivera was a huge womanizer. So you can you can see that by his look. <laughs> so never be. Never be um, tricked by the looks and appearance. Yeah, he was a womanizer. He actually um, made her suffer a lot as well. Like she didn't have enough with her broken body, and he he was not like. I mean, just just go watch documentaries, and you'll you'll have a lot more information, like genuine information about the 
the the love life of the two um, but uh, yeah she didn't kind of, she kind of didn't need that uh, she had a lot of she had trouble just moving and not feeling pain so um, she kind of didn't need an unfaithful um, husband but well uh, okay. I remember she kept a monkey as her pet I didn't know that Rachel 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 sorry uh, Frida had monkey as pets all right her paintings generate a high frequency of communication for the time period. Uh, okay, it's it's as if she gave her face male-like features. Probably, yeah. She didn't look as um, she quite looked. She looked actually very good. And uh, it's funny how she forces some 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 features, some some traits in her own paintings. Yeah, long live Google. I want a monkey. Could be cool. Could have a monkey companion right here. Helping me with the live streams. I mean, a, a, a little monkey like this one would be cool. And um, of course, a kind of chihuahua or I don't know what type of dog it is. Hairless dog? Does that exist? I guess it does, right? Let me try it. We can zoom in. It's very stiff. The paint is very stiff. It just feels very very textury, it doesn't feel fluid at all. It's almost like she she just rubbed it and dragged it with a like you know this dry feeling like when you when you rub the paint and it just sticks. It's some type of some type of mortar, like some type of 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 clay almost you know this weird feeling that's how you get this uh, generally this type of of texture it's a very carnal a very carnal uh, feeling and I, I I'm not surprised actually that that she didn't um, look for fluidity at all I mean, let's consider that you're trying to represent yourself. You're in pain. You you have all these um, these idea about your body being imperfect, being and and so you want to re you want the, the pain to not feel good when you apply it. You don't want any type of fluidity. You want something chunky. You want you want the paint to resist the brush, sort of. So this forces the, and you, you get this very di distinct texture right here, where you see all the brushwork. It's almost like the paint is drying while she's applying it. It's all chunky, it's all, all, it's all stiff, it's all, it's not even buttery or creamy paint, it's just, just almost dry paint. Well, that's how it feels actually. It's funny how all the details. Uh, 
Ah, the dog is a qual. Oh, all right. So that's uh, Mexican spelling of the day. Qualoixquinche. Qualo. Qualoixquinche. Like the Coco's pet. Qual. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> it's impossible. Sorry. Uh, I really... This hairless cat's called Sphinx. Sphinx cats. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're more famous, but yeah. The, the dogs, I, I knew the same. Uh, they have this, uh, like, just basically like this. So apparently it's called Koloitsquintle. Her style is called Naive Art. I wouldn't call it Naive as well, Barbara. Hello, Dr. Z. Naive art, guys. Get rid of it. It's the name of the movement, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to classify Callow. She had... Um, it's hard to classify. She had a, a meeting with... Um, meetings with the surrealist with andre breton for instance uh her husband was um the mexican i don't know how they call that um like socialist avant-garde uh thing i don't know exactly how you would call his style but to me like she's she's a surrealist and that's it Except that she doesn't focus on dreams, but more on um, on anxiety, fears, pain, and suffering. And yeah, I don't know. Her style, I, I just think it just speaks to to the the subconscious there is something understandable in what she's experiencing that she could not express with with words and uh, and yeah I I don't understand that to the same level as she does but I I just just thinking about my own experience, which has nothing uh, comparable, uh, which is nothing comparable to free dance, of course. But just speaking about my own experience and how these type of things can happen, like these type of visions that you have when you're in pain, when you're like uh, under severe pain. Um, I, I remember I once had a surgery, not nothing really special, just like the, you know, uh, knee surgery, like the cross. Uh, cross things i don't know how it's called in english so i just had this and it was made perfectly i mean there was absolutely no complications it's just um just great surgery uh great operation it was it went perfectly but i still had um not a lot of painkillers after that because they considered that i was uh the doctors uh consider that considered that i was young and i could just not take too many uh, uh, painkillers so they were probably right so there was this one night after the surgery where the pain was really severe and uh, and I kind of had like I was half sleeping and and in pain at the same time and I kind of had this uh, this vision this weird vision and maybe I'll, I'll do a painting one day because I, I still remember it quite vividly of you know a, a shark jaw 
I don't don't ask me why a shark jaw like you know these big shark jaws but like with no shark just the jaws the bone jaws and and the eye a huge eye uh, probably mine and I have this vision of the shark jaw and the eye was resting on on the jaw I don't know why but this type of vision I had and this was really a kind of surrealistic surrealistic vision and uh, and this was purely purely caused by the pain uh, working into my brain while I was half uh, you know sleeping and so, and so I, I understand how these kind of things can happen and this is why I think that uh, Kahlo is much more genuine uh, than, than uh, like let's say Dali for instance I always compare the two which I know they're not comparable but to me I'm much more interested in Kahlo because I think that that her visions are are really some some instant pictures of what was going on deep down in her in her brain you know and that's what makes um uh, her work so so strong in my opinion very very strong uh well at least I, I feel I feel connected. So you like or not, that's uh, that's perfectly fine. I know, but I, I think I think the connection comes from here. Um, she also had problems in her marriage, which are part of her suffer, uh, suffering in the pictures. Yeah, you're you're right, R two. Mm. So good evening, effectivement. Uh, she had many artist friends, etc. And with Diego, I was always taught she was with the surrealists. It's very similar to dream imagery. And uh, yeah, talking about the surrealists, you know, about the surrealists, all they have this. Um, I'm gonna explain later. Uh, I'm gonna come back to the surrealists. Um, <laughs> Be Beksinski wanted to photograph dreams in his art. I love Beksinski. Uh, her mind must be truly interesting to be able to come up with concepts like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if she even came up. See, Farida? I, I, I think she didn't really came up. It came to her. Um, I don't know if you grasp the the nuance if I make it clear but it's like an unavoidable an unavoidable thing that has to be expressed and the painting was a a, a sort of a, uh, instead of crying and and screaming uh, she just painted and I think this uh, this transforms pain into suffering and uh, this this um, the, the most noble thing a, a human being can do actually I think all right uh, I'm sorry you had pain hallucinations with your knee surgery you should definitely paint that yeah maybe one day I still have the picture in my mind uh, this is absolutely no problem I think it's going to be uh, stuck here but maybe also because you know, if I um, if I hadn't been an an artist, I would probably have had pain and say, oh, ouch. oops. <laughs> See, that's the pain. It's the pain for your ears. Um, if I hadn't been an artist at this time with my knee surgery, I'd probably say, ouch, ow, this hurts, and then go back to sleep, or take some more painkillers. Uh, but at the time, I was I was keeping the painkillers very low because I was uh, very interested in all these <laughs> in all these uh, dreams that I was having, and uh, I I still uh, I was I'm glad I did it because I I still have this mental picture in my head that's quite clear. I I have tried to draw it, but it's never 
as 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 good. I never tried to to paint it really though, but it's still very very vivid um, in my in my head. So I don't know exactly what I could do with it. Um, so so far it's never occurred to me, and I I I, I kept it somewhere. But I know that this um, this and some other some other visions like kind of dream things like some weird weird juxtaposition of things like you know like in a dream where things don't make sense but you have a clear vision and understanding of what they are even though they don't make sense at all uh well it's the kind of interesting thing that uh that well you might just want to keep notes of that because it's always a it's always a good um a interesting like topic to me um all right uh, by the way do you know Alain de Botton-Stock art as therapy uh yeah i know but art as therapy but i don't know Alain de Botton Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to France. All right, cool. Should be scared not take painkillers. I would be too scared to not take painkillers, but at the same time, I wouldn't trust them either. Um. Well, it's, it's not up to you. It's up to the doctors. But they they considered at least that I didn't um, I didn't need too much painkillers uh, because I was kind of young and uh, I, my health uh, was perfect and also they just said yeah let's give them the minimal minimal amount and I I think they were right I think they were right I wouldn't want to have felt nothing uh, I think it it kind of um, it, um, it it was good to you know go through the pain and and but hopefully in my case it didn't last for a long time but I was happy to push through and to get over it uh, myself like with as little uh, medication as possible well, not as little but uh, a little medication uh, Self-torturing for inspiration, we can all relate. Yeah, you know, the surrealists uh, did all sorts of weird things for inspiration, like getting drunk, uh, getting high. Um, yeah, so uh, lots of lots of strategies for the surrealists in order to uh, kind of pierce the the secrets of the of the subconscious. Uh, which they, to me, they did not succeed. Like, not no one succeeded like uh, Frida in representing idea of the subconscious. Like when you look at this, I mean, this is so weird. This is so weird. And even a, a crazy mind like Dali cannot find something like this. Nothing comes close to the weirdness. But this kind of weirdness and... This is super, super weird. I, I didn't remember about this one. It's called My Nurse and I. It just makes you speechless, right? <laughs> um, but she was not... I'm sure she didn't try to paint this as as kind of a... Provo provoking any type of, um, of reaction. She was trying to express a weird sense that she had. 
being taken care of by a nurse. It's like being slapped in the face. I mean, this painting is... No, it's being like... It's like being punched in the face. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Um, pain dreams, they make good art. <laughs> uh, at the end of the year, start to friends, I had extremely strange dreams. Y you should write them down or sketch them. Uh, Is it the possible archival factors of the paint or did she use a lot of reds and orange? I think she did use a lot of orange, reds and orange. Uh, is that a cat? Yeah, there's my cat. He's, uh, my cat, he's just... Uh, he was not happy. He was being by himself. I'm gonna show you. Hold on. So this is my cat. He was the one making the mess. Not happy. You're not happy, are you? Get out of here. Uh, can you talk about Paul Gauguin sometimes in the future? Yeah, maybe in the future. Uh, Kala was an, also an alcoholic and dr drug addict that might explain her suffering. I don't know. Um, I don't know if she drunk as a result of the pain or if the pain is the result of her drinking. Uh, Alain de Botton is the creator of The School of Life, a YouTube channel I can recommend to everyone. All right, cool. I'll check it out. I love Frida. Yes, that's weird. I forgot about that one too. I missed my giant heart, my giant art history book. Uh, did she have any children? Maybe it's kind of a trauma. Yeah, she couldn't have uh, She couldn't bear a child and That was part of her this great introduction To her the fact that she could never be uh, a mother uh, I think she had miscarriage um, I don't know how, M correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or she never had anything. Um, but yeah, well, this, this painting represents all the pain and suffering of a, of a woman that understands that her, uh, the condition of her body does not allow her to support and, and, and have a child. So, yeah, it's kind of um, another uh, another type of, of pain. The baby died in childbirth. All right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so many sad things. She had a very sad life. 
So I'm glad that I'm glad that she ch changed. She uh, translated this this pain into into art. It's, it's to me. It's much. It's much more meaningful than just crying about it and um, and dying without anyone to remember it. She gave us some traces of her time on this on this planet, and um, and she wanted us to remember her, even though all the pain she was uh, going through. She wanted us to. She wanted the world to understand that and uh, and feel what she was feeling. So it's a very deep. It's a very deep um, process, artistic process, turning this pain into actual human suffering. Pain is different from suffering. Like pain is just, just if I just poke you in the uh, in the chest with a with a skewer, you you're going to feel pain. But if you relate this pain to your condition as a human being if you relate this pain to your your existence to the meaning of your life to um, like a, a greater vision of humanity you transform pain into suffering and this is the philosophical difference between pain and suffering that I wanted to talk about. Because, um, yeah, there is a difference. Um, and, uh, and suffering is, is humane. Whereas pain is, is just a, a, a sensory stimuli. See the difference? Like, you can transform... So you can make suffering and turn it into art, but pain is just pain. So you transform the pain and you make it visible and you turn it into paintings. Uh, so yeah, that's I think that's what um, that's the most important thing about thing about um, about Frida. It's not an easy painting to watch at all. I mean, none of her paintings are easy to watch. And that's exactly the point, in my opinion. Like, if it was easy to watch, she wouldn't have painted it. If it, if it was just an, an easy experience, she wouldn't have felt the need to translate that into into paint. Oh. Alright, hello Mark, hello James. There are a few paintings that looks that look as sad as this. Because I think that the sadness is absolutely um, genuine. I mean, there is no nothing trying to make things look more beautiful or anything. The sadness just feels, um, 
I mean, you take her sadness right in your face. This is why I said uh, this painting is like um, and the, the previous one, but this one as well. It's like being punched in the face. Uh, so, oh, you think you you think your life is hard? Look at this painting. Oh, oh, you worked late and, and you think you're tired? Well, look at this painting. Oh, you had to, uh, you had to do this and that and, and you, you feel that it's a pain? Well, look at what pain is for me. That's what she's saying, uh, basically. And, uh, yeah. So, it's a humbling humbling feeling because you know that it's um well i i have no doubt that this is um this is true because i could for instance i could choose to paint make a painting about about pain and suffering just as a, as a theme but i would never paint it this way i would try to make things uh, more you know more bearable, more enjoyable to watch. Um, uh, why are there factories in the background? Because I think that she was in Henry Ford Hospital and was in um, Detroit, apparently. So that's the factories in Detroit. And uh, she had a uh, connections with uh, Henry Ford the Ford family at least uh, because they painted a, a thing with Diego Rivera or I don't know exactly what the connection was but yeah I'm not a lady so I don't know if there is they feel there is an obligation to have children I just feel that as a woman if you if you want to have children and you can't or your child dies I think a woman will always experience that a million times uh, with a million m times more pain than, than anyone like if you you bear the child during nine months and you lose it I mean the, the father of course is sad but the the woman is is just in this this type of condition it's more than sad it's uh, it's horrible she was a socialist but many in mexico hate her because they said she exploited the engine indigenous people there taking their symbols and selling them well exploitation was uh, pretty common um, in the first half of the 20th century unfortunately uh, yeah What what does the snail stands for? I don't know what, what this uh, machine is supposed to do. Doesn't feel right though. And yeah, I don't know about the snail. The snail is for the shape of the end of the uterus. Maybe. 
Maybe I I'm I'm sure it means something. Maybe it's just all the uh, an, an analogy of the time it takes to carry. I think Remedios Varro, another Mexican female painter, is much better than Frida. Yeah, probably. Today we're talking about Frida. That mission thing looks scary, taking a long time. Mm hmm See, I think this is another unfinished. This one is unfinished. It's about C section. It's another traumatic experience. Uh, and you can actually see the the technique. Well, of course, technically speaking, it's not um, nothing much really to say. not learn yeah exactly like you say Barbara I may not love her technique or praise her technique but her imagery took courage especially at a time when this was never seen before um, basically yeah so that's what what I think is uh, is interesting The flower of life. I always have this very textury. I don't think her work was about technique as much as it was about as it was subject matter. I agree, uh, Barbara. I think it was just about expressing whatever feeling she had, and um, and yeah, that's about it. This one as well. It's more political. So she was a a Marxist. She was socialist. Um, at the time, it was um, lots of artists and writers were. So the symbolism right here. It uh, this time it's less well. There's still the representation of her, the the body, 
everything but this part right here seriously it feels much less convincing so the title is uh, Marxism will bring health to the sick so right here the symbolism I think is much less convincing than when she's only focusing on on illness and and pain and suffering right here like all the 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 symbology on top right here it's all very very to me it feels like more like Diego Rivera and meh you know I, I don't really care that much about like you know okay all oh, this the um the 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 white dove and the earth is gradually getting red so the, the earth is getting uh more into communism uh we we saw how well it worked um and uh oh yeah this uh this is uh capitalism being crushed by Marxism. All right, good. Um, I think that the painting would be just much better with just um, her usual. I, I I think the symbology is 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 a lot weaker than what she was capable of in this one. Maybe because it's political, and you know, a political painting doesn't really survive the 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 through time because like politics it changes so if your painting has a strong political political um statement that that focuses on something happening right now with time it's going to lose some of its uh, some of its appeal some of its strength this american eagle looks like a turkey <laughs> many artists were socialists yeah you know at the time it was um nobody even knew what was happening in soviet uh, in the USSR so nobody knew about all the the gulag and and the, and the repression the oppression that was happening so um, especially like in Europe for instance many people were just seeing uh, communism from uh, from the, on the paper it looked really good like sharing uh, sharing um, the <clears throat> like sharing wealth to 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 stage uh, to to sum it up it just looked really really good on the paper um, and no one like it's not like today if something happens on the other side of the world uh, you know it uh, 20 minutes after uh, but at the time no one knew what was happening really um, in uh, Soviet Russia so for many people uh, communism was still a very viable option viable alternative maybe it still is i don't know i'm not saying anything on uh, i'm not making any political statement i i not just like historically speaking um it did not happen to prove uh, to prove really uh, that uh, as that good of a solution uh, at least in russia um these art talks live streams are so much fun i try to <laughs> as much as i can not miss them feels like a nice educational tea party note the land division green to the left
I don't know, uh, green to the left, or is it, isn't it red, because red is not, I, I don't think it's rotten, the, on the earth, I think it's uh, spreading, and the red is spreading, red is color of communism. Uh, Flo, have you talked about Degas? Yeah, we had an episode on Degas. And evil, even the most individualistic artists can stay away from politics that surround them. It's hard to, but, uh, well, you can. You can have a, an art that's completely... Um, completely ignorant about about politics it's um it's possible you just have to just not talk about it and try to take the broader angle but um like, I mean, as an artist, if you talk about politics, it's really that you chose to. This is strange that artists typically don't like repression, censorship, or being told what they can or can't paint. Uh, do you find it strange? <laughs> do you like repression, censorship, or being told what you can paint? <laughs> I don't think many people like this, um, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, around Frida. Okay, I understand what you said, Miguel. Okay, I, I didn't think about that as well. Oh yeah. Yep. But yeah, on this one, the symbolism is a. Uh, it's kind of bleh, you know. It's. Yeah, a little bit too easy. It's not as um, striking as um, some other paintings. Not too many paintings, though. Portrait of Luther Burbank. I don't know about this one. Let me check. So I'll le let you guys read about the So Luther Burbank was a botanist horticulturist So she represented him Half man, half uh, tree, right? See, when, when Frida is not in the center of the painting, I don't feel the connection. So this one, for instance, I... I don't... I don't connect to this one. So I, I think she really had something working around the, the idea of self-portrait. Uh, because as soon as she goes out of self-portrait, to me, it's not the same. I mean, for instance, this strikes me immediately. But the, the portrait of uh, Mr. Burbank didn't 
pretty. But this one does. Uh, I really like this one. Very, very striking. The only thing worth repressing is repression itself, Miguel. <laughs> I'm with you. Um, I like her art more now that I've seen more of it and looked. I like her art more now that I've seen more of it and looked at it deeper. Um, well, yeah, you have to just get into her shoes. And, um, and yeah, you kind of have to, well, it's funny because she's always like staring right into the viewers. So is she staring into herself, like looking in a mirror or is she staring into us trying to share with viewers? Because like, I mean, for every portrait, uh, with a straight up look like this you can always ask yourself uh, what's the meaning of the of the eyes uh, of the, uh, the 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 look directly into the viewer's eye uh, what's the meaning is it a reflection upon its oneself or is it a call to the viewers to somehow react somehow like give something back i and i think that this is a, a call to others and uh, and this is why most of her her self portraits are not about her as as such it's about it's a call for help kind of see a call for compassion a call for stepping into someone else's shoes and trying to understand for you as an outsider how it feels to be in the position of someone else and uh, and that's a, that's a, a very interesting vision of the self for me because uh, I've always been really interested in how the the self, the the individual needs like someone like it's an individual only exists if the others exist. Like you need some other people to uh, to create yourself as an individual, and and that's the this stare. Is kind of calling to me to me that's my interpretation is calling us um, in a way and uh, and yeah I think uh, she pushed the She pushed the possibilities of self-portrait to a new level. And... Uh, and she introduced true and genuine suffering into the art world, in my opinion. Because, well, before that you had... Well, you had people like Goya, for instance. But the the rest like in traditional in classical art the only like the, the suffering was only in religious themes like the crucifixions uh the pieta for instance the mater dolorosa all these things were um um treating the theme of of suffering 
from the angle of the religious stories. And this was the in, the in before the history of art because, well, it was just how it was done. And uh, Kahlo was the first one to introduce suffering as a part of self identification of defining the self the individual as a as a person even with all the suffering that it brings i don't know if i'm making myself clear but i mean it, it calls to you can't be just indifferent that's what i'm saying And I think that um, conveying this type of, this level of emotion is, uh, is still an amazing, an amazing feat for me. On her self-portraits, she said she painted herself so frequently because she uh, she herself was the subject she understood most. There are things which are not polite to say or talk about in public, so she 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 would paint it. Thank you, Barbara, for this uh, input. Paintings, I think, uh, the most recurring theme in her paintings. Uh, it is. Uh, it is uh, absolutely. Uh, she had polio at a young age and was in constant suffering for most of her life. Yeah, it's interesting, Miguel, as you say it, because when suffering is so present in your entire life, suffering becomes part of your individuality in a way, like your personality. This, this pain is part of you, uh, in a way. A part that you would like to, um, to not have, but still. Mm. She never had polio? Well, I've heard, I've read like biographies that say she had. Well, never mind. I mean, doesn't um, no, it's not the polio that made her suffer most of her life. But as you said, uh, even because she had the the, the bus accident. Uh, in her late uh, teens, I think. Late, yeah. Uh, but so uh, that that just says that um, even at a younger age, she already knew uh, disease. She already knew what uh, being in pain meant, because some kids never get sick, you know. But she already suffered even be before. Uh, but, and I, I've seen about the polio thing. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry, but she absolutely did uh, look it up. All right, I, I am not going to. Uh, I'm going to check the facts later. But yeah, I've I've read also that before her accident, she had polio. Uh, I don't know how. Um, invasive polio was at the time um, so it, it just means that yeah well so all her life basically all her life she almost always had something wrong with her body she insisted I never paint dreams I paint my own reality uh, that's right, Kevin. 
And uh, and I think this this quote, well, this is a Kevin quotes. Uh, I I I say it again. I never painted dreams. I painted my own reality. And um, and yeah, to me that's a very important quote because uh, let's say you know the the surrealists were very interested in the subconscious, in the dreams, and all. So this is what makes Frida a, a different artist and a, and a more genuine artist. Like I doubt that Dali had actual genuine dreams about all the things that he painted because I think that you can paint whatever uh, Dali painted just out of your imagination. It's not really hard. Just take some random things, put them into a painting and 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 pretend that it happens in your dreams. And when um because the surrealists were very interested in the in the Freudian um uh theory of psychoanalysis and the unconscious parts of the of the, the mind. So when um when Dali, well, you have, don't quote me on that, you have to check it as well. Uh, when Dali was, um, um, I think he met Freud, Sigmund Freud. And, um, and I, I think Freud said, um, well, let, let me check back again, because I don't want to, uh, so basically, Freud was not really interested in what Dali um, did in in his painting, but more what was happening subconsciously. And basically, uh, he was kind of let me just try to find if I can find. Well, I don't know exactly. I have to. I have to find the quote. I I read this a long time ago. And, uh, so basically, the way I saw it is like to Freud, it was not really um, an expression of the dreams of Dali, and that says that well, it was just a construction of the imagination, which is also perfectly fine I mean as a in a th surrealistic um, process it's still like Dali's work is just uh, full of very imaginative work and all uh, and trying to make it feel like it's it comes from dreams and all I don't I'm not sure I'm not sure I think it's more imagination producing paintings in the case of Dali but in the case of Kahlo, and I'm going back to the quote by uh, Miguel, uh, to Kahlo it was not dreams that she was painted, which might suggest that she was not a true surrealist in the sense that she was not trying to, to express dreams or suggest dreams. She was trying to express the reality as she as she um, experienced it sorry it's getting hard to uh, make an argument <laughs> um, out of words Daddy and Freud was such a crazy combination. Yeah, I'll have to check back. 
I, I thought I was I had something very clever to say about it, but I'm not sure anymore. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to not say it. <laughs> but I know that they met that most um, surrealists were very interested in uh, in meeting Freud. But I don't know exactly what she what he said. Anyway. Anyway. All right. I think I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna let this episode go. And uh, because I, I I apparently am not capable of. Uh, making a, a correct sentence anymore uh, <laughs> so yeah let's let's end it up on this note um, yeah lots of research to do on Kahlo if you want to have more uh, clever things to say about her than just my ramblings because I tell you these are just my ramblings so I am not an expert in any sort of way. As always, I'm, I want to make that very clear. Uh, so <laughs> don't trust me, don't quote me on anything and uh, go watch your, uh, the documentaries or uh, read a book. Uh, it's uh, interesting topics, really. And uh, so anyway, I hope you like this episode. And um, yeah, not everyone likes Kahlo, not everyone likes, first of all, the style, not everyone likes the themes, not everyone feels the connection. I still think she was a very important artist uh, for this era, and uh, she had a, a very important influence on what came after her. So that's it for today. Thank you for uh, liking this video and uh, I'll see you in a couple of days. Until then, uh, take care and uh, goodbye.